Lee. The title is Whatever Works, Integrated Mammalian Brain Evolution. Is that the Hansen lecture? Yes. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, so that's the Hansen lecture. So that's one that we would, that uh, is particularly important. Uh, Essex Brunch on Friday, the 8th from 10 to 11. The speaker is Kelsey Shakel, uh, PhD candidate in the Sutsui lab uh, in, in ESPM. Um, and the title of that is Kidnapper Ants. PhD finishing talk. That's a pretty intriguing title. Um, the Herp Group seminar that, that's uh, scheduled for Monday is um, is Andy Gacho speaking. So um, you know, Andy's a regular attendee of Herp Group. He works at 10X Genomics. He also um, is an adjunct faculty member at Merritt College, where he teaches a herpetology course. He's going to be talking about uh, the evolution evolution along the San Andreas Fault, a comparison of local endemic Phrynosoma macaulay and wide ranging Callosaurus trachinoides. His PhD work was on sand lizards and other, you know, phrynosomatid lizards from that the Southwest should be great. Um, Fossil Coffee is going to be held on Zoom on Tuesday um, from 11 to 12. And uh, the speakers will be um, Kat Magulik, Tara Lepore, and Andy Tholt. The title is Ecological Filtering During Major Dispersals, Understanding the, select the Selectivity of Migration During the Great American Biotic Interchange. Uh, I guess there's, these are... We didn't really connect the, the speaker to the title, but additional titles are Timing the Evolutionary Origin of Mammary Glands and Assessing Their Relationship to Other Integumentary Structures. And then the third is New Depositional Age Constraints for the Cretaceous Paleogene Transition, Hell Creek Region, Williston Basin. Are there any other seminars that I might not have had listed here that should be mentioned? Okay, so I'll, now the, uh, the, the main event. Uh, I'll introduce today's speaker. So today's speaker is Corinne haining Laverty. Hopefully I pronounced it correctly. Um, she's a research associate and fellow at the LA County Na uh, Natural History Museum. And, um, and she's going to be talking about North America's Galapagos, the Historic Channel Islands Biological Survey. She has a very interesting background <laughs> and one that is intriguing to me. So her background is in business. And so like me, her bachelor's degree was in business, except hers was from University of Virginia. She also has an MBA from the University of Southern California, and she worked in banking. She was a senior vice president for a major bank for 30 years. Um, and yet she also is uh, a member of the board of trustees for the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History and an associate of the Santa Cruz Island Foundation and, um, and on other boards as well. And so it's what she didn't do in her, in her bio was describe how Banker becomes the author of North America's Galapagos, the historical Channel Islands. Uh, so I'm really excited to, to hear about this, and hopefully you'll tell us about the. Uh, no, it wasn't about, <laughs> it, would be, it would be great to hear the connection, like how you found your way into conservation biology and writing this important book, which is on the LA Times bestseller list. I mean, it's a really intriguing story. So Thank hopefully, you. get to hear it. Floor is yours. Really lovely introduction. Thank you. I'm not sure I deserve all this, that praise, actually. Um, how do I get rid of that, Carly? Because it's not showing up on my computer oh. screen. Do you have to your mouse? I think you could do it with your mouse on the screen. That's right. There we go. No, it's just... Oh, oh, oh how about that? I didn't know. Okay. Do you need the lights, though? I don't. Um, so. All right. Well, again, thank you very much um, for that introduction. I am really thrilled to be here for a number of reasons. One is because this is the first live talk I've given in over two years since the book launched. And it's great to be in front of a live audience again. And I welcome all the people on Zoom as well. I'm glad that we can continue using that kind of technology to expand our reach. But secondly, is because this institution played a role in the Channel Islands Biological Survey. Three of the PIs studied here one under Joseph Grinnell and one under Kroger. And the other one, I'm not sure who exactly he studied under, but they did study here. And additionally, the archives here were used in the creation of this book. My friend, Barbara Peterson actually came here and collaborated with me and we figured out what pieces of information I wanted to get and it, they did find their way into this book. So it's thrilling to be here and I thank you all for your attendance and interest. Now, before we start the top, the topic um, of my lecture, I guess. Since we're going to be discussing the California Channel Islands, the first inhabitants of which were the island Chumash and the island Tonga people, I would like to take a moment and, and ask you to 
to join me in extending our respect and gratitude to these original island caretakers for their conservation and stewardship of these magnificent landscapes. So thank you. All right, now, uh, where's my, how do we, huh, oh, why, why am I? I'm having, I'm not getting my, my the mouse is, you've got like two screens up right now. So if okay. you just, like, if you look at the mouse, I'll move it and now it'll appear on their screen. Oh gosh, okay, I hope I'm not gonna lose it again. Uh, I should have had this up a little earlier because uh, I wanted to acknowledge all of you too. All right, now this book recounts the never before told adventures and ambitions of a group of scientists, researchers, and naturalists who came together in the late 1930s to embark upon a series of unprecedented expeditions. Their mission to piece together the human history and biological evolution of California's eight channel islands. Now, before we dive into, oh, and I should say this, this, this survey was launched by the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. And there were two things that really made it unique and set it apart from any surveys that had ever come before, and it has never been replicated. And those two things are the eight island breadth of the survey and the multidisciplinary scope. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. Now, at first I was a little afraid that all of you were gonna know everything there is to know about the Channel Islands, but as I've talked, to some of you, I realize that's not the case. So that's great because I'm going to do a little level setting and introduce you to these islands before we get into the survey itself. So here they are, California's eight channel islands lying within the Southern California Bight like giant paint splatters on a Google Earth sized Jackson Pollock canvas. They didn't always look this way, however. In fact, millions of years ago, the rocks that would become the channel islands were here, buried on the seafloor. Near present, day San, near present day San Diego. And then through really complicated plate tectonics and geologic activities, some of these rocks were dragged as much as 150 miles northward and then rotated as much as 180 degrees clockwise. About 2 million years ago, they began rising up out of the ocean in approximately roughly the configuration they are in today. However, there were several differences. Now, first, before we get into those, I do wanna just let you know that today, scientists think of these islands as, as two groups. We think of the Southern Islands here and the Northern Islands. And there are kind of general differences between these two sets of islands. Um, in one of them is the amount of fresh water that are on the islands. They vary considerably. Anacapa and Santa Barbara Islands, the two smallest islands have absolutely no fresh water on them at all. With Anacapa, there's one caveat, there is a sea cave that's only accessible by the ocean where there's a freshwater drip, but it doesn't really help the top of the island and the animals and plants living on it. So those islands are completely dependent on rainwater and fog for their freshwater sustenance. Then one of the big differences was that when uh, the islands first came out of the ocean, the Northern islands were once one island, which is this blue outline here called Santa Rosé. And Santa Rosa was 76% larger than the combined land mass of the islands today. And you can see the mainland coastline here in blue and then the current mainland coastline in brown. They, it was much closer to shore. So it was only about five miles from shore. So you can imagine that species had an easier method of getting onto these islands because of the proximity to land. And these islands, especially the three larger ones, share more species in common between each other than do the Southern Islands. The Southern Islands were never attached to one another. They were never attached to the mainland and they were always further out to sea. So there is less in general species diversity on the Southern Islands. Catalina has a fair amount of critters on it, but um, in general, they're less than the Northern Islands. So what you should just remember from this discussion, sort of about the history and the geologic history, is these islands were never attached to any terra firma that could have colonated them with plants or animals. And that means everything on, there, on them had to get out there, establish themselves, and then evolve somehow. So with that as a little bit of a background, I wanna take you out to these islands and show you some great photos. So these Channel Islands, let me tell you, they are wild. 
<laughs> Harsh. Thrilling. And spoiled. Spoiled in terms of humankind's careless use of them through the introduction of exotic species such as horses, cattle, sheep, goats, rats, rabbits, pigs, agricultural crops. Now this photo is, I took um, in the Central Valley of Santa Cruz Island, and you can see these buildings over here are the remnants of an old winery that was established in the mid to late 1800s. And this entire landscape, all this green was planted with vineyards, was a vineyard. And while I'll be the first person to say that every island deserves a little wine, Perhaps we shouldn't be growing the grapes on them unless they're native to that island. And then we have the issue of inter, in, incidentally introduced plants as well, which as you know, all of these things are detrimental to island ecosystems. Despite this, these islands have remained resilient in their unruly ability to, re to resist domestication, no matter how forcefully we've attempted to use them for such pur purposes as ranch lands, big game hunting parks, recreational venues, movie sets, we can talk about the bison later if y'all like, <laughs> and bombing ranges. Catalina, I Santa Clemente Island is the Navy's only live ship to shore firing range. And I can tell you from personal experience, they use it that way. Even so, 100, approximately 150 plants and animals currently make or have made their home on these islands and nowhere else on the planet. Hence the island's nickname, North America's Galapagos. Now I don't have time to talk about all the animals and plants, but I do wanna mention a couple of them. First of all, I promise we'll talk about the fox a little bit more. He's just too cute not to talk about. Um, but I wanna draw your attention to this bird. This is the uh, island scrub jay. And the island jay is descendant from the mainland jay. Um, however, he's about 25% larger than the mainland jay and much more brightly hued. And he's the only bird uh, species, full on species that is indigenous to the Channel Islands. The, this jay once lived both on Santa Cruz and Santa Rosa Island. It is now no longer on Santa Rosa. You can only find it on Santa Cruz. And if you go to Santa Cruz Island, you are going to see this bird because it's raucous. It's kind of, you know, it's very loud and, and it's very easy to spot as well. Grinnell had a little hand in some of the subspecies of mice. He had some suppositions he made, and I cover a little bit of that in the book. Um, but the real animal that I want to talk to you about on this page is this fellow. This is the Santa uh, Catalina Island ornate shrew. Can you see it? Okay. Um, the scientists on the survey suspected that they would find shrews on some of the larger islands and they were looking for them. But until 1940, no shrew had ever been found. However, in 1940, or maybe it was late 1939, Jack von Bloper Jr., who was the mammalogist and bat expert for the survey and the Natural History Museum, got his hands on a specimen. And he examined it and determined that it was a subspecies of the mainland shrew. These shrews are still fairly rarely seen on Catalina and Catalina is the only island that we've ever found shrews on. And in my book, I talk a little bit about the story of how Von Bloper got hold of this specimen. And it tells you a little bit about the serendipitous nature of fieldwork and science itself, plus the US Postal Service. But I'm not gonna spoil the survey, this story for you. Um, another animal, now I mentioned that some unique animals are extinct and the pygmy mammoth is a great example of that. The Channel Islands pygmy mammoth evolved from the larger Columbia mammoth. Um, scientists think that the Columbia mammoth came to the islands of between 20 and maybe 200,000 years ago. Um, and they might've come in successive waves. So they came over a couple of times enticed by the you know, predator-free environments and so forth. And then over time, some of their young um, evolved into the pygmy mammoth. Now, what I like best about the pygmy mammoth is it's not just a miniature mammoth, it is a, uh, it evolved to occupy a different ecological niche. No small surprise to all of you, I'm sure. So it ate different foods. It ate tree bark and leaves, whereas the mammoth, the Columbia mammoth was a grass eater. 
But the other thing that was really interesting is its muscular and skeletal ch structure changed. So it evolved to have what amounts to four wheel drive ambulatory abilities. It could get up really steep island slopes and up onto ridge tops and mountains that the Columbia mammoths couldn't reach. And it had a braking function that kind of let it get down those same slopes. So today when scientists go out to the islands to find mammoth bones, they find uh, Columbia mammoths only on the lower step tundra areas but they find pygmy mammoths everywhere. And interestingly also, the pygmy mammoth never made the reverse commute to the mainland, so no mainland pygmy mammoths have ever been found. Okay, now we're gonna get to the fox, the Channel Islands fox. He's really cute and he has a fearless heart. If you go to the islands, um, you will likely see this fellow because he'll come right out. They're, they are not diurnal. They come out at all times of the day. They check you out. They wanna see if you left anything on your picnic table. There are six distinct subspecies of foxes that live on all but the two smallest islands. And of course, there's no water on those two islands. So there's no foxes on Anacapa or Santa Barbara. They did evolve from the mainland gray fox, which is much larger. The Channel Islands fox is about the size of a house cat, weighs maybe six pounds. Um, and again, he's just wonderfully fearless. Um, they are the, uh, oh, and we believe that they were the, Gray fox was probably brought over by the Native Americans and their tamoles, and then rather quickly they evolved into this small critter. They've never found any intermediate sized fox remains, so, so that's a good project for somebody if you want to go out there and do that. Um, they are the smallest canid in North America, and this fox is the top terrestrial predator on the Channel Islands. Pretty amazing because he's so little. However, his status as the top terrestrial predator did nothing to save it from going nearly extinct just at the end of the last century. Now to give you an idea of the magnitude of this near extinction event, which was repeated on all six islands that the fox inhabits, it was estimated that in 1994, there were about 1800 Santa Rosa Island foxes living on Santa Rosa Island. But by the end of that decade, 1998 or 1999, there were only 15 individual animals left. And that was mirrored on every single one of the island, that kind of dramatic decline. Now, it was a very tough um, conservation problem to help the fox because they wanted to keep the gene pool, pool clean, of course, so they had to keep all the island foxes separate. They did a breeding program on each island. But there were a little bit of bits of differences for why the foxes were declining on every island. So Every island had a little bit different solution. And I have a book up here I'll talk about later if you wanna read more about it, but I do go into that in my book as well. Luckily for the fox and for all of us, through the concerted effort of NGOs, US government, Navy, private citizens, this fox has recovered on all six islands that it inhabits and is today being closely monitored so we can prevent this near extinction event from ever happening again. Um, so for the people who are interested in gardening and botanying, I want to just give you a little tiny taste of the plants on these islands. This is a Dudleya. It's the Santa Barbara Island live forever. And it only lives on one square mile of land in this entire world. And that's that little tiny Santa Barbara Island floating out there in the middle of the Pacific ocean. And, um, again, Santa Barbara has no fresh water on it. So it's simply rain and fog that keeps this plant and all the plants on Santa Barbara Island alive. And then on the other side of the side spectrum, we have this Santa Rosa Island Tory pine. This pine tree occurs only in two groves on Santa Rosa Island and nowhere else in the world. It is related to the Santa, San Diego Tory pine. And if you're so inclined, it's easy to visit this pine tree, this, these groves, because there's a nice pier here and you can take a boat over a park concessionaire as part of the park service and just take a nice little hike up to see these gorgeous trees. So in addition to the natives and the endemic animals on the Channel Islands, other species rely on them for their survival as well. And seabirds are a prime example of this. And that's because seabirds are ground nesting birds and they simply hollow out a little space on the ground. They lay their eggs on the ground. They incubate their eggs on the ground. They hatch their eggs on the ground and then they fledge the young all on the ground. So if they are living in an environment that has predators, it really wreaks havoc with their populations. And this was happening on the Channel Islands, especially on Anacapa and Santa Barbara, where there were no historic po populations of foxes. 
Um, luckily, the Park Service has removed all non-native um, animals from the Channel Islands, and we are seeing a great resurgence of seabird populations on Anacapa and Santa Barbara Islands. Now, interestingly, archaeology is really a fascinating part of the Channel Islands story. In fact, the National Park Service deems the archaeological sites on the Northern Channel Islands to be among the most valuable in North America, if not the world. This sentiment is, record, is repeated by a well-known archaeologist from the Smithsonian who states that the record on these islands plays a role in research questions, research issues and questions of global significance. So what are these questions of global significance? Just let me get a little bit of water real quick. Well, one of them is the manner in which and timing of when people first came to North America. Up until probably 25 years ago, most of us were taught and learned that people came, with, people came to North America by walking over the Bering Land Bridge through the ice-free corridor of Canada, and then down into the central part of the United States in an area called Clovis, New Mexico. And while that did happen, and it happened about 13,000 years ago, evidence that has been collected over the last, say, 35 to 50 year, 40 years on the Channel Islands now lead scientists to believe in this Pacific coastal migration model of habitation of North America. And this model holds that people with seafaring capabilities paddled up the shore of Siberia across the Bering Sea and then followed the coastline of North America all the way down into South America, of course, settling on the coast mainland and also on the islands as they did so. And um, much of the support for this theory comes from the Channel Islands. More recent research in Chile and also Oregon has found a lot of other compelling evidence, but we're gonna talk about some of the things the Channel Islands has contributed to our better understanding of how North America was populated. Before I do that, I just want to point to this black and white photograph. This was snapped in December of 1941 by Jack Kofer. Jack Kofer was the youngest member of the Channel Islands Biological Survey Team. He was 16 when he stepped foot on Santa Rosa Island. His mother had to write him a permission slip, letting him go. <laughs> um, and he was uh, on, on the southwest side of Santa Rosa Island, which, which is this of collecting mammoth bones. And this is Tecolote Canyon, which is where he was working. Um, and this picture on the right is a shell midden. For those of you who don't know what a shell midden is, it's a place where um, people cast the, the unusable items or the detritus of everyday life. So there might be a mussel shell where they ate the mussel or a broken fish hook or bone or something. And over time, these piles accumulate and they offer evidence not only of technological changes, dietary changes, but also sometimes there are um, carbon materials in it that can be carbon dated. So one of the things that has led scientists to think that there is this uh, coastal migration route is that there are a preponderance of sites on the Channel Islands that date to 9,000 years of age or older. Now, it's not only the number and the, you know, the preponderance of the sites and the age of the sites, but remember these islands were much, much bigger in the past. So the first occupied sites would have been on the coastal areas and they are now underwater. So these sites that they're finding are sites that people would have had to move into over time to populate. So that gives evidence. Furthermore, um, the oldest shell midden ever found in North America is on San Miguel Island. And this is San Miguel Island right here. This is not that shell midden. That shell midden is called Daisy Cave. And Daisy Cave offered evidence that was that proved definitively that people used San Miguel Island and that site for over 12,000 years, because it dates to 12,000 years of age. So if people had just gotten to North America 13,000 years ago in Clovis, New Mexico, it's highly unlikely that in 1,000 years, they would have been able to get to the coast of North America and then develop maritime capabilities, allowing them to get to the most northern of the Channel Islands. It's really rough passage and so forth. And then, the last piece of evidence is in 1950, Phil Orr of the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History collect, saw some bones eroding out of a hillside. And so he took the whole block back to the museum and using the best technologies available to him, he dated these bones and they were the oldest ever found in North America. His um, predecessor, 
or I guess it's not predecessor, but the person that's now the archaeologist at the Santa Barbara Museum, John Johnson, he redated them within the last decade, and they are over 13,000 years of age. And so that makes them the oldest human remains ever found in North America. So taken all together, we have the specific coastal migration model that we now believe was how people first got here. And people probably came to North America between 14 and 20,000 years ago, or possibly even much long, longer. So you can see from that, I hope, that there's lots of interesting things out on the islands and lots of reasons that scientists want to go out there. And people had gone out there. But again, nobody had ever attempted an eight island scope with all the disciplines. So whose idea was this anyway? Well, credit for that goes to this man, Donald Meadows. He is the father of the Channel Islands Biological Survey. Don Meadows in 1938, when he proposed this idea was a 41 year old Long Beach, California high school biology teacher, a lepidopterist with a personal collection of 20,000 butterflies, a husband and father. And he was a very ambitious man. At the height of the Great Depression, he left his nice teaching job to come up to Berkeley and get his master's because he wanted to attain a position teaching in higher education. And after he got his master's, he went back and he found himself still in the Long Beach high school system. Nothing wrong with being a high school teacher, but that wasn't what he wanted for himself. So he decided, oh, well, I guess I'm gonna to have to get my PhD and I'm gonna do something for my thesis that had never been done before, is study the butterflies and moths on all eight islands. But he realized that this was a really big undertaking and he'd need some help. So he went to this man, Dr. John Adams Comstock, the director of science at LACM at the time and himself a lepidopterist. So he proposed it to Comstock that they would you know, collaborate on this effort. And Comstock was a very learned man. He was a visionary and he saw merit in Meadows' idea, but he saw it as something much bigger. He envisioned an eight island survey that would include all of the sciences. So biologists, ornithologists, botanists, paleontologists, archeologists, invertebrates, everything. He wanted all of his scientists to participate and he expected that it would take them a period of five years of field work in all of the different seasons collecting specimens that they would then bring back to the laboratory for scientific analysis and review. And then he expected them, of course, to write scholarly peer reviewed articles. Following that, he wanted them to write articles for the popular press. And then he wanted them to develop museum displays so that the public could become more aware of the Channel Islands. So on Christmas Eve, 1938, he and Meadows proposed to the Honorable Board of Governors this unprecedented series of expeditions. And lo and behold, the governors approved it, which if you think about it, is pretty remarkable because this is late 1938. There's a war brewing across in Europe. The country itself is suffering still the effects of the uh, Great Depression. And LA was besieged by police racketeering and political corruption. And I think that the reason that the governors approved the survey is that Comstock included one very shrewd provision in the proposal. He promised the Board of Governors that this unprecedented series of expeditions would cost the museum nothing over and above the regular staff salaries of the scientists involved. That meant that citizen scientists like Meadows and some of his Long Beach teacher friends here could participate, but they wouldn't get paid. It also meant that the scientists were responsible for bringing all of their own camping, personal camping gear to the islands. They were responsible for buying their own food, hiring their own camp cook. And all of you who've been on field expeditions know it's really important to have a cook because you're too tired at the end of the day. But most importantly, they had to find for free transportation for themselves and their considerable gear to and from the islands and between the islands. Well, luckily they had John Adams Comstock working for them because he developed two great relationships that served the survey well over the next several years. One was with Cal Fish and Game, who put their cruisers, the yellow fin and the, or the yellow tail and the blue fin at the survey's disposal. And the other was the millionaire oil gentleman scientist, Alan Hancock, who had this gorgeous research vessel that he built, the Valero II or three, 
and he had donated it to USC and USC had a museum there for him to deposit the specimens that he collected when he went to the South Pacific where he did a lot of his collecting. And he said, sure, if I'm in town, I'll give you guys a ride. <laughs> so February, 1939 launched the Channel Islands Biological Survey. All right, so I'm gonna introduce you a couple more scientists. One is Jack von Bloker Jr. He was the mammalogist and bat expert. He was really, he loved bats. And he was my favorite character because he was compulsive, he was driven, and he was flawed. And he self-described himself as having been born under an unlucky star. And I can say from my research that that star sometimes burned very darkly in his life. He was a great field man. He loved to go out to the, to the uh, field and collect, but he was also pretty good about bringing his specimens back into the laboratory, writing and examining them and writing up his finds. Another thing that he did that um, he probably hasn't gotten as enough credit for was he really was a proponent of ridding the Channel Islands of the non-native species. And I use this picture here because he's, this is um, taken in 1939 on San Clemente. You can see he has foxes, two Clemente foxes on either side of this post. And in the middle is a feral cat. He got rid of his share of feral cats on these islands. And he became an advocate. He wrote letters to the organization that would become the National Park Service urging them to get rid of the non-native animals, particularly on Anacapa and Santa Barbara Islands, where he was seeing the decimation of those seabird populations. So Van Bloker also had um, studied here under Joseph Grinnell. He had a master's from Berkeley. And Grinnell actually encouraged him to continue his work on the land mammals of Southern California while he would pursue a PhD. So for the next 25 years, this is where that compulsiveness comes in. He was trying to do those two things. And remember, there's a war and all these things are happening, plus his unlucky star was burning all the time. So he had a lot to overcome. Um, then the next person I'd like to introduce you to is Arthur Woodward. Art was the historian and archaeologist for the survey and also for the Natural History Museum. And Art was so unlike Meadows and Von Bloker, Hollywood couldn't have scripted a different person. Art Woodward was a rabble rouser. He liked what he liked, let you know what he didn't. He liked to stir up the pot. And he really didn't care about degrees or anything like that. He too studied here for two years and then he quit and he went to New York City and he never finished his undergraduate degree or anything further. He was or, um, given an honorary degree in retirement. But even though he didn't publish about his time on the Channel Islands, he is credited with bringing a new level of scientific rigor to archaeological investigations. So he was much more than a curio collector or an antiquitarian who had gone out to the islands previously in, in great numbers. Now, the first great first big find was made on San Clemente Island. It was this cave that they named Big Dog Cave for the large ceremonially buried dog they found inside of it. But really what was most remarkable about this cave was that inside was a number of soft goods that normally deteriorate in mainland or, coast or, or island, inland island sites. And the reason that these soft goods, mission cloth, a couple pieces of mission cloth were found there, otter fur, some wooden boat parts, including the prow of a boat that still had the rope attached to it. All of these items were basketry. They were all preserved because it was sighted right over the ocean. And the salt spray came in and impregnated the cave over the time as things were being you know, left there and basically pickled these soft goods. And so they collected all of these items and brought them back to the museum. They're at the museum now, at the Natural History Museum. You can go see them. And though Woodward didn't write scientific articles about the, his finds, he kept a magnificent field record. And I used that field record a lot in the writing of my book because he really filled in a lot of details. He told me what was going on. And it's a really good thing he did all that because today this cave is completely off limits to pers uh, military and civilian personnel because of the unexploded ordinances that litter every entry point to it. So you can't get in. And if the military were to detonate the bombs, it would just destroy the cave. So that's that. Now, <laughs> um, another one of um, Woodward's primary research interests interest was the Lone Woman of San Nicolas Island. 
And if you grew up in California, you might have read Scott O'Dell's book, Island of the Blue Dolphin, which is a fictionalized account of her true story. And her true story encapsulation is in 1835, the mission fathers removed her people from the island. They were the last people taken off and put into the mission systems. But somehow the lone woman stayed. New research is coming out that's really fascinating um, about really what happened to her and why she went back and so forth. Additionally, there's been a, a great cache of items in redwood, two redwood boxes that were found underneath a whalebone. And these boxes were put into the hillside and they were just eroding out and over 223 items of which some are pictured here in this um, drawing um, have been found that can be dated back to her time or the last or her people's time or you know, 1835 to 1853 because there's buttons and um, glass beads and things as well as things that she might have put in it or somebody of her tribe might have put in it. At any rate, he was, Woodward was fascinated with her story and this, you know, people knew she was out there for 18 years all by herself from 1835 to 1853 before she was brought in. And the sea captain that brought her back to Santa Barbara Island was George Nightever. So Woodward took Nightever's memoir and he retraced Night of his footsteps along the island to every place he went looking for her. And he photo documented his whole story. So there's pictures of everywhere he went. And then he, because he was in search of her whalebone hut, which he thought he'd find. I'm gonna show you that in a minute. But this oil painting was made in collaboration with several well-known um, archeologists who study the lone woman's story. And the thing that um, it was just, it's a recent, painting but what's interesting about it is she's holding this tarred basket it's a waterproof basket that the Native Americans made with the natural tar seeps and this basket and this cormorant feather robe that she's wearing were brought with two items that she brought back with her to the mainland when she was taken off the island the basket was given to California Academy of Sciences and it unfortunately burned in the 1905 or 1906 fire but there are photographs of it remaining and this feather robe was sent to the Vatican. And um, there is a search by somebody who's looking for it and has gone to the Vatican to look for her feather cormorant robe. So I think that's kind of fun. Um, so this is the whale bone. These are the 19 bones here in the foreground, which, which uh, Art Woodward believed belonged to the lone woman and, and it was her hut site. And that has been discredited by scientists today. There were just too many um, bones, you know, hut sites, and they weren't really her house anyway. They're more like windbreaks. But there was a cave that's been found, and that I talk about in my book, where they think that might be have been where she lived. And unfortunately, that's been sealed off for NAGPRA reasons. Okay, so I'm almost done talking, promise. I have a couple more things I wanna mention. And one of them is the composition of the survey itself. 33 people participated in the Channel Islands Biological Survey. That included citizen scientists like Don Meadows, who came up with the idea. And it included um, youth, teenagers like Jack Kofer, who was only 16 when he went to the island first, and Harry Fletcher, his buddy who was working with him, and this fellow, John Schrader. It included immigrants. This is George Kanikoff. He was the museum's vertebrate zoologist, and he immigrated from Russia when he was 26. And it included women. This woman here with her back to us is Ona Van Bloker. She is Jack's wife, and she served as his field assistant and camp cook, unpaid, of course. She logged the third most days on the island of any of the researchers. I think her husband had the most. So I give Ona a lot of credit for going out there. These, these islands are tough if you've been there. But also this woman here, this is Marion Hollenbach and Marion and one other woman, Barbara Loomis, um, partially through the research that I did on this book, we believe that these two women were the first two trained female archeologists ever to work on the Channel Islands. So all in all, a fairly diverse group for its time. And um, so I give the, the survey credit for that, among other things. All right, this last slide here is of um, the last expedition, expedition number 13. I call it unlucky 13 because the scientists came to this island in November. They spent about six or eight weeks there in total. A couple of different groups went out there. They had two encampments, one over here by the Vale Ranch House which is the main camp. And then the boys were over here at Elephant Camp um, on Tecolote Canyon. And you can see Arlington Canyon is just around the corner there. 
And that was where Arlington Man was found, which are these really old human remains. At any rate, um, Jack Kopfer and his buddy Fletcher were out at Tecolote Canyon excavating these gorgeous mammoth jawbones. It happened to be Jack Kopfer's 17th birthday, December 7th, 7th, 1941. When the Vaqueros, yes, you know, the Vaqueros rode up to these boys working on the hillside and said, Pearl Harbor has been bombed, December 7th. The West Coast is blacked out. Ship traffic is stopped. We can't use our radio phone. We don't know how and when you're going to get off this island, but you better go back to the main camp in case someone comes to get you. So the two young men did as they were told, but they didn't have time to take these mammoth jawbones out of the hillside. And things are done differently now where they took the individual specimens, but today, you know, they take the whole piece out. So they did the best thing they could think of, which is they put a plaster jacket on these bones, leaving them in the hillside, hoping that they or someone else could go back and get them at the later time. Now, I did check with the National Park Service, LA County and Santa Barbara Museum, and no jacketed jaw, jaw bones have ever been found, which means they probably fell out of the hillside and were crushed by thousands of hooves, cattle hooves. The boys did go back to the um, main camp and leave it to John Adams Comstock to somehow commandeer this cattle boat, the schooner Santa Cruz, to go out and get his staff and bring them back to the mainland one day later than their original itinerary planned. This had to have been a bittersweet channel crossing because this survey was now ended. It was cut short by war, but yet its primary goals were met. Every island was visited at least once by a full contingent of scientists, but that was the end of the Channel Island Survey. So I thank you very much. I hope I haven't talked too long. <laughs> Questions? What piqued your interest in doing this? Um, I went to the Natural History Museum with a different idea of what I would like to write. My, my goal since I was in seventh grade was I would write a book one day. And I've been a writer, but I did other things, obviously. And I, so I had this idea for a book. I went to the Natural History Museum to the archivist and their um, scholarly publications person, editor. And I pitched the idea. And they, archivist said, you're going to go to all that trouble. You should write this story. And she pushed a couple of dusty boxes my way that were labeled 1939 to 1941 Channel Islands Biological Survey. And I thought, oh my God, that sounds so boring. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought, well, if this is the opportunity that's presented to me, I should at least look at this archives. And I'd never been in archives before. I love research. I mean, like back in the day when you did like high school research. And so I opened up the box and I found inside of it handwritten letters from people on the islands to the scientists. I found their progress reports, old newspaper clippings of the survey. I found um, you know, pictures of children and families living on this island of you know, these ranching activities. And I just fell in love with the people, the scientists and the people that lived on the island. So that's what spurred my and I went and did it. <laughs> How long did it take you to research? I should book? have a PhD by now. <laughs> 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 took a long time. Uh, I think I started probably about 2012. The book was accepted like in 17 or 18, um, but it was peer reviewed. So uh, it was published by the University of Utah Press. I, th I think I showed you a picture of it, which is, you know, the cover right there. Um, anyway, so, and then it took about two and a half, three years to get it published because of the peer review process and then you know the university and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. What have you learned about what makes it a good field member? Well first of all I think the hard copy is really great. I, I, I'm probably not the right person but for me one thing I've noticed is a lot of these guys have really great handwriting. You know they're beautiful <laughs> handwriting which is not me at all. But you know it was things like they would include the weather and I think Grinnell, Grinnell had it nailed where he said, you don't know what you need to know now, what you'll need in a hundred years. So to record you know, the weather, the other insects or animals around whatever it is you're doing, um, any activity that you see, whatever you're, you know, if it's an animal, what is it doing or who's, who's interacting with you? So just to record a lot of information 
I mean, that made my book more interesting, I think, having Woodward's um, documents, but I guess that's what I would say. Yeah. Mm. Related to that, I'm curious, you know, so we're about to, to be here a long time, you're at our own field work to come to this day. I, I'm interested in the distinction between the citizen scientists and the, the professional staff. And I, related to the field notes, I'm just curious the extent to which personal relationships among members were recorded in those field notes, the interaction between uh -huh. members of the party and how that played a role. Or at least what you could. So your first question was. Um, there's some of it, but you know, I kind of had to piece it together. For instance, something happened with Woodward, where I think he got kicked off for a while. And like I said, he was a rabble rouser and he had, but he would write something in his field notes like, I'm so glad to be leaving San Nicolas Island. I, this is a dark something. And then the next thing I know, he wasn't on the next survey. And so I'm thinking, well, what did he do out there? You know, and I couldn't figure that out. It might've had something to do with women. I'm not sure. Um, but so I love that he had those clues. And then I went back and this book was sort of written in series. Like first it was just like, where did they go? How, where'd they find what they do? And then I went and went, you know what? I should go get Meadows field notes from Irvine, you see Irvine, or I need, I need um, uh, Art Woodward's field notes, and they were in Arizona at the Historical Society in Tucson, and then I needed something from up here. So I started adding all that, and I started creating characters, because I would look at the obituaries, and I would find everything out I could find about the people, and so then I had a paper cron file of exactly everybody's everything, right? I took all their letters and every interspersed them, and then I went, oh, but I need to hear their voices. So I took out each scientist, the, the major characters' um, notes, and I made copies of them and put them in their own binder. So I had Cron, and then I had this, this, the particular PI's binders with just their correspondence. And so then that went, you know, I didn't, it didn't get lost that Von Bloper was writing to the Park Service about these birds, because now I could read it and, and I could see he was writing and he cared about this. And I could see that, you know, Meadows, he gave up being a scientist. To, you know, with, within 10 years after the survey, he completely, he sold his collections. He got rid of everything. He threw them away or whatever, you know, he didn't throw away, but he got rid of it. It was sort of like, wow, you didn't get what you want. So you just gotta, you know, hang up your, your whatever and, and go away. You know, he was sort of pouting it sort of in a way, but I found that by putting their, their work together and reading it. Um, and then the, the last thing I did, which was probably kind of the most boring, but also really important, and it is in the book, I figured I needed to give context to the times and what was happening at the museum. So I went into the museum's um, Board of Governors minutes, and I read what was happening all the places at the Channel Islands Biological Survey. And I found out there was a lot of infighting going on at the museum with the director and the science staff, and he wanted to turn it into something else and Comstock was sort of fighting for his scientists. And so I had to use, this is a long answer, but I had to use all these different clues to figure out what was happening and you know what was happening to people. And actually here at this museum, one of the things that I thought was most interesting is um, Von Bloker wanted a position in the Smithsonian and he wrote to, I think it was Miller, who was one of the directors, Alan Miller, I think. And Alan Miller said, well, I'll give you a recommendation, but I've already recommended somebody else. So I don't know if you really want me to recommend you because then I'd be looking like you're the second. And, and Von Bolker said, no, 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 I really want you to recommend it. Well, he didn't get the job. So this, you know, so, to, and that, and then, so you really found out what, what was driving these people inside by these kind of pieces of correspondence. And also Miller's response, you know, he really didn't want to do much for Von Bolker for whatever reason, I think. So, no, but Jack Koffer was alive until last year um, and very mentally fine. He became a cinema, cinematographer, um, did a lot of Disney films. He was on the Jonathan Livingston Siegel movie. So he won some awards there. And then he lived in Kenya for 20 years, um, was an author and so forth. So I did talk to him and some of his recollections that I, I talked to him multiple times. I feel like I became friends with him. He was wonderful. Um, but some of his recollections are in the book as well. 
Yeah. One question about the foxes. So I might have a um, an incomplete understanding of what happened with that with their rear extinction. Mm -hmm. So I was under the impression that the bald eagles had disappeared because of DDT or some other cause, and that that prevented them from being there to exclude golden eagles. And golden eagles were knocking out the foxes. That, that was the story? no. It's not the whole story, but it's a big part of it. Um, so I don't know if y'all heard that, but. At the time, you know, Montrose was in Torrance dumping their wastewater into the Pacific Ocean and, um, you know, went up the, the uh, chemical went up the food chain DDT and killed out the bald eagles because it made eggshells too thin for the roots. And bald eagles are fish eaters, whereas golden eagles, who are also being predated upon, because in the 60s, you know, there were still people who were shooting golden eagles because they were killing their cows or whatever, you know, sheep or whatever on the mainland. So golden eagles, without bald eagles there to chase them away, they started commuting out to the islands and they were eating the foxes because the foxes were not diurnal, whereas the, whereas the skunk wasn't hit as bad because it was more of a nocturnal animal. So that was part of it. But then the other part was, why were the golden eagles coming out there? Just not only because the bald eagles weren't there, but because on this island, there were baby cows or cows. On this island, there were pigs. So there was food out there that nobody else was eating. So the golden eagles could come out and start predating on the young and the old and the sick. And without the bald eagles that had chased them away, they started taking over. And so the reason that became so complicated for scientists was because you know on one island, you had to get rid of cows and the Siberian elk that had been imported and the, you know all that. So you had to round up those guys. But on another island, you had to get rid of like Santa Cruz to get rid of the feral pigs really hard. They couldn't get rid of the pigs. They finally brought in sharpshooters from New Zealand who know how to keep their island clean of non-native animals. And they built pens, huge corrals, where they would go into a, like, I mean, these, and it's really rug, rugged landscape. So they've had all these pens and they would kill all the pill pigs in one corral, but now they couldn't get away to another area. And then they'd go to the next area and they'd eradicate the pigs from that area. So, so every island had, and then on Catalina, there was a distemper that they thought came from dogs because dogs are allowed on Catalina Island. But really they think now it was probably from raccoons that stowed away on boats that came over and then the raccoons introduced the distemper and it was killing them. So hard to figure out. And then like on uh, San Clemente, part of it was, well, with like there's a bird called the uh, loggerhead shrike that's a San Clemente um, subspecies. And you know their habitat was getting bombed, and the cats were eating them. <laughs> you know? So they had a really big problem. So that the government now has a San Clemente breeding program, a loggerhead shrike breeding go program. Well, I think you mentioned they're still like actively bombing on San Clemente Island. Mm -hmm. And is there like, are they monitoring how that's affecting the wildlife there? Okay, I I think that's a great question. And um, when I first I was actually scuba diving once out uh, overnight on San Clemente when the military said, you guys are in an active bombing range, you got to get out of here. So we did in the middle of the night, we moved. And when I sort of first heard about that, I thought, oh, that's horrible, horrible, right? That's what all of us think. But now in reflection, I want to say a couple of things. First of all, the archaeologist who's retired but spent his time on San Clemente Island as a military contractor, um, he said, first of all, the bombing is limited to about 15%, maybe 20% of the island only. So it's pretty localized. And while that part, like he saw, we looked at pictures from their time there to now, it's totally different because of the bombing activities. Um, it is fairly localized and they have done, the military has done a lot of good work too, like with the foxes on Clemente with the loggerhead shrike. So they're investing in the environment for the rest of the island. Plus, I was talking to Simon about this earlier, you know, military bases provide some benefits to our wildlife because they provide open space, fly, flyway zones. They provide place for animals to live that aren't being developed. And development is probably one of the worst things for you know, the native environment. So I think you have to, to be fair, balance out that a little bit. And, and I have some pictures I'll show you later that are really fun on San, San Clemente Island that I don't wanna be filmed. Um, showing you those pictures. Um, um, there's, there's a couple questions in the Zoom chat. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
you want to um, ask them and let's see. Um, okay, so Andy is asking as a C as CI is a national park, when you ride the yacht from Ventura, are the only islands the public can tour Santa Cruz and Catalina? Where is Avalon? Is the NPS based only in Santa Cruz? Oh, no. Okay. And I, was, I wonder if I could, I should have put a map here, but there are five islands that are in Channel Islands National Park. That's a great question. So it's the, all four of the Northern Islands. So San Miguel coming from the North off Point Conception, San Miguel, Santa Rosa, Santa Cruz, Anacapa, plus Santa Barbara Island, which is about 40 miles offshore, the little tiny island. So that's all Channel Islands National Park. And you can pretty easily visit those islands. Then of course we have Catalina Island, which is still basically privately owned by the conservation, uh, Catalina Conservation Society. Catalina was owned by, first by the Banning Brothers and then by um, Wrigley. And Wrigley actually, fun fact, established the Cubs training base on Santa, Santa Catalina Island and the first Wrigley field was on Santa Catalina Island. And so Wrigley established the conservation society that now pretty much controls Catalina. So the two that are military bases are San Nick, which is the one from Island of the, um, the Lone Woman's fame, that's 64 miles offshore. It's primarily um, a missile tracking base, pretty still hard for civilians to get on that island. And also San Clemente Island, which is the furthest south, um, is a really highly secretive military training base. The SEALs train there. Um, they have, they do the dark landings because you're out to sea, so it's very dark. So they do dark airport landings. They have some submarine missile um, trenches that they can do submarine. I don't know what all they do out there, but it's, <laughs> they do a lot out there. So did that answer the question? Uh, that sounds great. There's one more in here. It says, um, besides Grinnell, Von Blocher, and Woodward, what was the role of Raymond Hall at ECB? Uh, I forgot. He's in my book, though. I could look it up I, in my index. <laughs> I, I, he, I remember reading a little bit about him, Raymond Hall. Uh, let's see if I can, this will jog my memory. Oh, 273. Let's see what I say. Is that okay? <laughs> uh, okay, so on the same day the Board of Governors met, Von Bloker wrote Raymond Hall, his former boss at the, at the MVZ at Berkeley, who at the time held the prestigious title Curator of Mammals. Like Von Bloker himself, Hall studied as a graduate student under naturalist Joseph Grinnell and was considered one of Grinnell's brightest students. Over the years, Von Blocher maintained a professional relationship with Hall, exchanging information and sharing specimens, but his tone, um, but the tone he employed when he wrote Hall about the 12th expedition seemed out of place to me. In the letter, Von Blocher boasts that, quote, the expedition to the islands was quite successful considering the tough weather and that despite almost daily rain or wind, he collected nearly a thousand vertebrates in eight weeks. He also brags that there should be some interesting papers coming forth from the result of the survey. Von Blocher's bold assertion could have been an attempt to elevate himself and his institution to Hall's and the MVZ's level. This is all my supposition. <laughs> or it is possible that rumors of reorganization staff cuts at LACM had filtered down into the ranks and he was currying Hall's favor in case he needed a job or recommendation in the future. McKinney, the director at LACM, had been talking of reorganization since early 1941, and matters such as these have a habit of trickling out from behind closed doors. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, when uh, Von Bloker wrote his paper for the first Channel Islands proceedings, his uh, institution is given as LA College and not the museum. He did leave the he did leave the museum in, in 1941. He did take a job at um, USC as part of um, Hancock's museum, and he was better paid there. No big surprise, probably. Um, and he never went back to the museum after that. So then, eventually, he went to um, LA College and was a professor it, there. It could be LA State University. Or I I don't know. What I mean, I'm afraid. Yeah, I'm I don't to know. Figure out that. And then Phil Orr changed from being at the Santa Barbara Museum. When I met him in the 1960s, he was at the uh, California Academy of Sciences. 
I didn't know that either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, as you know, these guys all move around and when they died, they had a habit of, or when they left an institution, sometimes they left because they're mad or something. And so, mm -hmm. you know, they don't leave their papers and all their work to like, you know, Woodward didn't leave it to the Natural History Museum. He left it to the Tucson Historical Society, which is like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, Meadows left it to Irvine because he became a historian. Um, that was what he ended his career doing was he was an Orange County historian of, of some great recruit. I think maybe we should bring it to an end now. And let's thank Corinne for a really good